isn't it? Man, it's good to shout our praises and sing how awesome that is. How many of you were happy with the outcome of the Super Bowl last week? Okay, okay, seven of us. Super, okay, awesome. So, yeah, I mean, that was kind of incredible, wasn't it? I text one or two uh, people in the congregation who I knew were New England fans, and when they were, like, way down, I text one person in particular and said, hey, you know, just wanted to check in, make sure you're okay. And they said, just remember, we're never out of it with Tom Brady. And I text back, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so much for that. So, but good. I can do my own level of harassment. I receive it, but I dish it out, so I deserve whatever I get. But, uh, hey, two announcements real quick before we dive into our, uh, to our teaching this morning. Uh, the first announcement has to do with our building program. So right, you're aware that uh, right, we've, been, we've announced probably two or three times, we're right on the verge of breaking ground, we're right there. And, uh, and so, you know, I would almost say that again, like we are right there. Here's the current issue that, uh, that's being negotiated between our building committee and the, uh, and the township is, uh, is that of a sprinkler system. So the township wants us to put a sprinkler system in all of our old facility. Um, that would be quite a costly adventure. So we are trying to uh, negotiate the possibilities of that and what it could be and, and so forth. So that's kind of what the, the hitch is right now. But I believe, I believe as soon as that's resolved, right, as soon as that's resolved and we're, and we're projecting out maybe, maybe three weeks that'll be resolved, we might be, uh, we might be ready, to, ready to see what happens. So, but anyhow, so pray about that for us, right? Because, you know, when you're, when you're involved in this and you, and you think you're ready to go and then something else pops up and you're ready to go and then something else hits the table. So we're kind of invested in this process and the team's doing a great job working at it. So just pray for them and, and just pray that the Lord would open the doors and, 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 uh, and allow us to, uh, to get moving on this project. And then the second thing is, and I'm just giving you some, some general information here and a, and a little explanation, is uh, if you receive our email, Emails, right? The weekly emails we sent out from the church. You, you possibly read this already. We are doing a media update up here on the platform. And if you're aware, you see two new projectors up there and two projectors like that will be put on the sides. And, and, and there's a reason that we're doing this. And that is uh, that um, we've been experiencing some system failures. So there was two Sundays in December that we almost did not have any of this because of system failure. Now, you may not be aware of this, but the system was put in in 1999, which uh, was a great, great deal when they put it in. It was a, it was a, it's a, it's a wonderful system, and they put it in, and, uh, and, and, and everything worked great. But you know how technology goes, right? They keep creating new technology, bigger technology, so forth and so on. And as they create bigger and better technology, once they get so far out, they stop servicing the old technology. Well, that's where we've been where we're at now. Because believe it or not, what we actually use up here is the generation before standard definition. I know that's hard to get our mind around because we live in an HD world now, and we are now in our third generation of HD, which means the technology that we're using that we're, you know, that we're broadcasting in is like five generations old. Well, they don't service that anymore. Our switcher that we use every Sunday was, uh, was built in 1980. It's a 1980 model. That switcher is older than I am. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> rumor has it Fred Flintstone used that switcher, but nevertheless. So, so anyhow, what the board had decided is, is we knew we were having some, we knew that there was a possibility of having big issues, and we've had them on and off and have been able to tape and spit and stick things together. Uh, but, but they went ahead and say, let's, let's have a plan in place that if it becomes crisis that we respond to it and we can act upon it. And, uh, and they didn't want to do it, right, during, you know, as we're also moving into a building program. They didn't want both things happening at the same time. But nevertheless, what took place the first couple of weeks of December, uh, you know, caused us to, uh, to say, okay, I, you know, it could be that we show up a Sunday and it's just gone. And if it's gone without us being more proactive, it could be, you know, quite a while until we have everything wired and replaced and so forth. So, so they made a decision to release some funds that we've had in reserve to HD all the wiring and, and, uh, and, and, and to buy these projectors. And then there will be a, a, a motorized screen, so that'll be off the wall here. It'll be lifted up so that you can see it. Um, and, you know, and the screen can be you know, raised and, and lowered and so forth. And, and so, uh, so that's going to be good. There is one thing, though. In the, in the funds they released, they released enough to HD the system, 
But what they were hoping is that we could raise the money for the cameras because, uh, because you also need to upgrade your camera level. And so, uh, and the cameras are in the same shape that when we talk about the switcher and so forth. So, uh, so the cost of the cameras collectively is $65,000. And so I know you go, oh my gosh, I, can't. I know, I get it, right? And, uh, and so, uh, so, if, so if you want to participate that and help us do that, um, that would be awesome. I mean, and that would, that would help us out. And I know uh, Jim's been working on it, and, uh, and he already has several thousands of dollars raised. And, and so see him or email me or talk to me, and, and, and so we can have this uh, up and, and ready to go and, and make sure that we're, uh, we're doing an okay job. So, you know, it's kind of like when your car breaks down and your refrigerator breaks down at the same time. And you say, boy, which one am I going to fix? And you go, oh, I think I'm going to fix both of them, right? Me, I would go for the refrigerator because that's the... That's obviously the most important appliance in my life. But, uh, but anyhow, so that's kind of the, the situation here. But I want you to just be aware of that, of what's happening, and, and knowledgeable about it. So now we're going to change the topics, really. I mean, we're going to make a sweeping topic change because we are beginning our teaching series on sex. And I, I do want to announce, right, there is a PG-13 warning on this. So uh, if you're okay for your children to be in here, I guess I'm okay with that. But just be aware of that. And uh, after the service, don't come up and say, how in the world could you say that? My five-year-old was in the service. Well, good. Great. <laughs> now you're anticipating. Now you're like, whoa, what's he going to say? Well, here's where we're going this week, just, or this month, just so you know. Today's topic is about why marriage matters to sex. Okay, and we're after, we want a biblical foundation in, in God's design of, 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 of sex and, and, and where, it, where, it, where it fits in our life. And then, and then next week, we're going to talk about why sex matters to marriage. And then the week after that, Pastor Kelly and I are going to kind of share the message. And we're going to talk about why sex matters to the husband, to the men, and why sex matters to the wives and the ladies. And that's kind of where we're going this week so, or this month. So, uh, so plan on that appropriately. And uh, whatever we need to do, we think it's going to be all right. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your presence in this place. For, uh, for, uh, for your work in our lives. And, and Lord, we're going to talk about a subject that, uh, that the world has owned the translation of it. That the world has been the loud voice about sex. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us today to, be, to, 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 to gain a biblical understanding. Uh, that, that we would learn something. That we would grow. That you would speak deeper than our hearts and our minds about this wonderful gift that you've given us and where it fits and what its purpose is and, and why marriage is important to it. So Lord, Lord, just speak to our hearts, our minds, our lives today and, and help us, Lord. Help us to be anxious, to be uh, just obedient to your wonderful plan for our lives. In your name, Jesus, amen. And amen. So why, why does marriage, why is marriage important to sex? Let me start off and define sex for you if I can. I didn't get this definition out of a book. I didn't, I didn't read it from some sort of fantastic author. Perhaps I should have. The definition might end up being more correct or better. But this is just my definition. Just based on some, some studies that I've done in the scripture and trying to capture the whole idea of, of sex portrayed in the scripture. I just wanted to give us like something to kind of have a handle on it as a, as a framework work uh, to, to define it for ourselves. But this is what I believe the biblical perspective of sex is. Sex is the crescendo, the building to, and the highest expression of relationship of a husband and a wife who have aligned their heart and their souls with each other and with God. Now I want to say that again because right that's a lot to think about. But but, but sex is the crescendo, it's the building to and the highest expression of relationship of a husband and a wife that have aligned their heart and their souls with each other and with God. So why is, why is marriage important to sex? Well, do you know that God designed sex to illustrate, to help us understand facets of our relationship with him? So God designed sex to, to help us understand facets of our relationship with him. So let's talk a little bit about some of those illustrations, some of the facets of those relationships that, where sex is supposed to help us to, to understand our relationship with God. So do you know one of the four words that is used in the New Testament to describe the church, to describe who we are collectively? You know, the four words are this, the word church, 
obviously, which means called out once. The word fellowship, which talks about the relationship that we're supposed to have with each other. The word body, which means we're supposed to be his hands and his feet moving actively on his behalf in our world. And the fourth word is the word bride. The word bride is a word in the New Testament used to describe who we are as the church. We are the bride of Christ. And what that's supposed to represent is it's supposed to represent our singular devotion and commitment to our groom. That like we're, we, we're, we're devoted to our groom. I mean, we have a singular devotion and commitment to our groom. No one competes with your spouse. No one competes for your care, for your devotion, and for your love with your spouse. I mean, your spouse is, the, is like, is like they, are, they, they, they stand on the top rung of the ladder. No one competes. And, you know, even the idea of marriage, right? Marriage is covenant language. And one thing you find out about, about God in the, in the scriptures as you read through it is if God is in relationship with you, he's in covenant with you. That's the way he builds his relationships, right? We talk about the covenant that he made with Noah and the peoples of the earth. We talk about the covenant that he made with Abraham. We talk about the covenant that he made with Moses. We talk about the new covenant. Right, the new covenant that we participate in, right? The new covenant established by Jesus Christ when he gave his body and his blood on the cross of Calvary. There's a covenant relationship. There's this idea of, of covenant that attaches itself to relationship with God. And that's, that's how he relates with us. He forms covenant with us. So even the idea of, of, of us being the bride, right? Of us being the bride and, and Jesus being the bridegroom, it moves the whole concept of, of relationship into this idea of covenant. Psalms 19, 1 through 5 describes the glory of God. And listen to the way it describes the glory of God. It says, they have no speech, they use no words, yet their voice goes out into all the earth like a bridegroom coming out of his chambers. So you get the power of the image, right? That even the glory of God is attached to this idea of covenant relationship. And the bridegroom comes out of his chambers and he's, and he's strong and he's handsome and he's glorious. And it pleases the bride to see the bridegroom. And, and the glory of God is, is even put inside this context, this covenant of marriage. Genesis chapter 4 verse 1. It says this. I'm using King James Version language, right? Because it's just a little easier to explain that way. But it, but it says, Adam knew... K-N-E-W, Adam knew Eve, and Cain was conceived. Adam knew Eve, and Cain was conceived. The Hebrew word for knew is the word yada. Now, now here, in this passage of Scripture, the word to know is also the word for sex. That there's this idea that, that this sexual activity is this depth of relationship where Adam knew Eve at an intimate, at a personal level. A level that goes way beyond simply the physical. A level that goes to the emotional. And a level that even goes to the spiritual. That Adam knew Eve and Cain was conceived. There's this knowledge that was attained in, in their sexual relationships with each other. Of how they cared and how they loved, how they interacted, and how their bodies united. Well, you know in Psalms 46.10... It says in Psalms 46.10, be still and know the same Hebrew word, yada, that I am God. It speaks to a depth of connection that takes place through the, through the joining of our bodies physically. And it's used by the scripture to describe the depth of knowledge and understanding and desire and connectedness that is possible with God. Knowledge is placed in the covenant of relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, you know, all throughout the Old Testament, we talked about how God creates covenants all throughout the scripture, right? So God makes the covenant with Abraham. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. And, and even the idea of covenant, when we think of covenant, you know, we translate it today as, well, they have a contract, right? They have an agreement together. They, they, they have some sort of legal obligation to each other. Well, you know, covenant, covenant goes way beyond this idea of legal obligation. You see, what a covenant is, is a covenant goes to the depth of, I have a moral and an ethical obligation at the depth of my soul. And in spite of what any court system would say, or in spite of what any loophole would be, 
covenant means, man, I am going to give my life to fulfill this covenant. I'm going to give everything I can to make sure that I operate within the boundaries of, of this covenant. Now, now normally, when, when a covenant is agreed upon in the Old Testament, they, have a, they, they use a certain phrase in the Old Testament, right? It's called cutting a covenant. Have you ever heard that phrase used before? We're going to cut a covenant. And let me tell you where that comes from, or the imagery of cutting a covenant. So when, in Abram's case, when, when Abraham and God, when they had come to this agreement and covenant, here's the ceremony of cutting a covenant. God says to Abraham, I want you to line up all these animals, calves, bulls, whatever. We're going to line up all these animals, and I want you to split them right down the middle. Just cut them right down the middle. So one's on this side, the other's on this side, and there's a pathway in between these animals that literally have just been sawed in half and split. And then what happens in the covenant is there's, there's a suzerain who's the powerful one, and there's a vassal who's the weaker one. Now, when you cut a covenant, what normally happens in a, in a ceremony where you're cutting a covenant is the vassal, the weaker one, would walk in between those animals that's just been decimated. And the imagery is to say, if I don't fulfill my covenant to you, may what happens to, to me, if I don't fulfill it, may what happened to these animals happen to me. So in this Abrahamic uh, uh, and God covenant cutting ceremony, what took place as Abram was there was he had a vision. And it wasn't Abraham that walked through those divided animals. It was a, it was a fire, a fiery pot that appeared and went through the middle of those animals representing God himself. So that God was saying this, Abraham, if I don't fulfill my covenant to you, may what happened to these animals happen to me. And you know what the covenant was, right? You know what the covenant was between Abraham and God? God told Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I mean, you're going to have, you're going to have, have, have family that, that just is like the sand on a beach. You're, you're, just going to, you're just going to fill it up. You're just going to fill the world up, your people are. Well, the, the role, the, the way in which that covenant had to be fulfilled... Right? The only possibility for it to be fulfilled, the only way to fulfill that covenant was for a barren Abraham and Sarah to have a child. So the only way for, for God's covenant to be fulfilled to Abraham and to Sarah was through the act of sex. That they would be sexually active together, the joining of their bodies for the creation of life. And sex becomes the avenue for the fulfillment of covenant between God and and Abraham. We can go on and on and on through the scriptures with illustrations of this, of, of, of how, 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 how sex is, is, is built inside of this idea and the reality of covenant relationship. In fact, do you know sex is when a man and a woman sacrificially give their bodies to each other for the good and the pleasure of the other? Do you know what's supposed to happen to us when that takes place? It's supposed to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ himself gave when he gave up his body for our good. It's supposed to remind us of the new covenant, of the relationship that we have with God and how good it is for us as we sacrifice our bodies with our husband or with our wife. Do you know it's easy? It's easy to embrace the sacredness of sex the idea that sex itself is an act of worship when we understand how and why God created it. It becomes easier to, to understand the sacredness of sex when we understand why and how God created it. That it's, that it's an act of worship. It's supposed to draw us closer to Him. It's supposed to illustrate the possibilities of relationship with Him in all of its different facets. So, so why, is, why is marriage important to sex? Because sex is about more than simply the physical. I mean, God designed sex to teach us facets of relationship with him. And marriage, marriage is the covenant that that relationship was designed to flourish within. Sex, the crescendo, the building to, and, and the highest uh, uh, expression of a husband and a wife that have aligned their heart and their souls with each other. And with God. 
Hey, you know, another, another thought about this idea of why marriage is important to sex is that, is, that, uh, is that God created sex with real power. I mean, sex has real power. And that real power is just to show us the, the power that can take place in, in relationship with God. Like, 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 we understand, and we don't have to talk about it long, that, that there is a sex drive that goes to the very core of our physical design, Right? That if we have a healthy body, a healthy functioning body, there is a, there is a drive towards sex in that body. There's an inner pull. There's a, there's a strong movement towards sexual activity. The power of sex is seen in its ability in the scriptures, and it tells us this, in its ability to take two separate individuals and make them one. That's power. In fact, it says this in 1 Corinthians 6.16, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. It says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. For it is said the two will become one flesh. God designed sex to be powerful. God designed sex to, to, to bring together and unite two people. He designed it so that sex would mingle not only the body, but that sex would mingle the, the emotions and that sex would mingle the, the, the souls. And soul mingling is designed to make a very real emotional and spiritual bond with only the one you're in covenant with. And that's powerful. It's powerful to think, man, the scripture says the two become one. That's incredible. You know, like fusionary power that God puts in the, in the act of sex. You know, the power of sex is also seen in that God chose sex to be the avenue in which he would create life. That sex is the avenue in which the creator of life creates life. I mean, we would agree here, hopefully we would all agree, that God is the creator of life, and he's the, he's the single and, and only creator of life. And we understand, right, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, it says God forms man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And we understand that he created Eve, and, and we understand all of that. But we also understand that, that since that time, that he has chosen to breathe the breath of life through the act of sex. It's how he creates, has chosen to create life. It's his chosen design. And, and when we understand those things, when we understand the power to unite, when we understand the, the power of the drive, when we understand the, the power to create life, it becomes easy to embrace the divine power that God has weaved into sexual activity. It's easy to embrace that when we see how God has designed it. And, and power like that, right, Right, power like that is an incredible gift that, that, that he gives us. But at the same time, power like that needs to be placed within covenant relationship. Do you know the divine qualities that God has infused into sexual activity is so strong. The divine qualities that he's infused into sexual activity is so strong that sex itself often becomes the item or the activity that is actually worshipped. I mean, there's so much power that he's put within sexual activity that, that the world gets confused. They see the power of it and, they, and, and it actually becomes what people pursue rather than understanding that it illustrates something higher. I mean, they get confused about it and that's what they seek after. and That's what drives them because of the power that, that God placed within sexual activity. So, for instance, as you, read, as you read throughout the Old Testament, you see that one of the issues that often uh, has tripped up Israel is Baal worship, right? You've heard of Baal worship before if you read through the Old Testament. It's one of the things that, that often, you know, trips Israel up. It, it pulls them away from God. Well, let me talk to you a few minutes about what Baal worship is. So, Baal worship is a sex-driven religion. Sex-driven cultic activity. You see, the mindset of the people then, and we're talking about people thousands of years ago, right? The mindset of the people then were, were they were agricultural, right? The, these folks that participated in Baal worship. And this is what they, they, they believed. They, they, they needed the ground to produce crops for their survival. And they knew that, uh, that for the ground to produce crops that it had to rain. And then when the rain came, it, 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 helped, the, it helped the growing season. And the more rain, the better growing season they had, and so forth and so on. 
Well, they came to believe that the rain was the semen of the gods. And that as the rain fell, the semen of the gods fertilized the ground and then the crops came forth. In fact, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the idol for Baal worship was a bull. You know, if you look in your Bible dictionaries or whatever, you'll see that a bull is the, is the, is the idol, right, uh, for, for bear worship. And there's a reason for that. And the reason that they chose a, a, like, like, like a bull to be the idol for bear worship is because of the bull's sexual activity. When a bull engaged in its sexual activity, right, I mean, man, they saw the strength and they saw the power of that beast and they saw the amount of semen that the bull produced. And in that, they were like, whoa, this is exactly what needs to happen so that our crops will grow. The gods need to drop their semen upon the ground so the crops will grow. And, 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 and as you, so they began to like, like think about how do we do that? How do we manipulate the gods? How do we get this to take place? And, and when, you, when you read in the Old Testament, you'll read about high places that were created. They're always, always against God's will, but there were these high places that were created. And, and, and these were, these were like cultic worship, Baal worship places that they would run to and worship. And, and in these high places, there would be Asherah poles. And they would literally worship around the Asherah pole. Do you know what an Asherah pole is? An Asherah pole is a carved part of the male anatomy. And they literally would go to high places. And they would worship around this Asherah pole, a male part of the anatomy. And they would worship around it, right? Believing that, hey, we're going to worship around this and the, and the gods are going to bless us and, and the crops will grow. And a part of their practice became, a, became this idea of trying to manipulate the gods by participating in, in sexual activity. So they would have temples and these temples would have priestesses. And, and the men, would, they would go to the temple and they would, they would involve themselves, engage in sexual activity with the priestesses, right? Believing that as they did this in worship, that it would, it would cause the gods to, to release their semen upon the grounds and fertilize the ground. You know, the worship of Baal always caused Israel to, to, to stray from God. I mean, they would take this wonderful creation of God that was designed for one man and one woman to, to begin to experience what relationship with God could really be like a physical and an emotional and a spiritual union that was designed to be celebrated wonderfully in, the, in this covenant relationship. And because of the power that God has placed in it itself, instead of allowing that power to point them towards God and to understand more about Him, instead they used it to point themselves away from God. They removed it from covenant relationship. They believed that the power of sex could be used to manipulate the gods. And the power created to enhance God in their lives actually was used to pull them away from God. So, so, so here's, my, here's, here's kind of my final thought on this, right? Is that, is that sex removed from God's designed covenant creates chaos. Sex removed from God's designed covenant creates chaos. And we see that lesson all the way throughout the scriptures. We see it because of just God's command to us and God tells us what takes place in the midst of it. But also we see it in the stories, right, of the scripture. Like you take Abraham and Sarah. We talked about Abraham's covenant, right? They cut this covenant with God and God says, you and Sarah, you're going to have a child. And well, it takes a little while and Sarah's not getting pregnant and they get frustrated. So Sarah, in trying to help God fulfill his covenant, offers to Abraham her handmaiden, you know, Hagar. And, and, and so Abraham and Hagar, they sleep together. And, and next thing you know, Hagar's pregnant and Ishmael's born. Well, that didn't fulfill God's covenant. That wasn't God's design or plan for them, Right. They, they removed it outside of the, the God's plan of covenant relationship. And, and then what took place was, uh, was, was ultimately God's covenant was fulfilled and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. And then the tension and hostility between Sarah and Hagar became unbearable. And, and the tension of, of relationship between, between Ishmael and Isaac became unbearable. And there came a point, listen to this, there came a point where Abraham had to say to Hagar and Ishmael, he had to say to his son, you can't stay here anymore. You can't be in my home. You have to go away. 
And he had to send his son away. Can you imagine how painful that was? How heartbreaking that is? I mean, I mean, the reality is the sex removed from God's design creates chaos. I mean, we can point to the story of David and Bathsheba, right? The story of David and Bathsheba. And here David is. David's on his rooftop, right? He's, he's on his rooftop. And, and I don't know if he's doing the peeping Tom thing or he accidentally sees Bathsheba. But whatever happens, he sees Bathsheba bathing on her rooftop, you know. And he sees her and he dwells on her and he begins to desire her. So he says, go get her and bring her to me. So she, she, she arrives, and, and David and her involve themselves in a relationship and in sexual activity. And, and what happens to the two of them, right? What happens to David is like his heart is drawn. I mean, his heart and his emotions and his, and his being is mingled with Bathsheba. The only problem was Bathsheba was somebody else's wife. Bathsheba was the wife of, of Uriah, one of his most faithful generals. So you know how the story goes. Here David is, he has this faithful general that's been faithful to him. And, and yet he's, he's, he's involved himself in an activity that's mingled his soul with, with, his, with his general's wife. And, 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 and so you know what takes place? He has Uriah murdered. Yeah, I mean, I mean he sends Uriah to the front line, right? And says, hey, I want, I want to, during the battle, I want Uriah to go to the front line. And, and then I want all the troops to back down. So Uriah goes out leading the battle and then the troops back away and they leave Uriah on his own and he's killed. David's scheme. You know, whenever, whenever sex is taken out of God's covenant design, it always, creates, it always creates chaos. When sex is handled loosely, outside of God's guidance, chaos ensues. Families are shattered. Homes break apart. I, I can't tell you how many hours your pastoral staff has invested in trying to help homes find healing. Because this wonderful gift that God has given us has not been maintained in covenant relationship. The the results are, are devastating. Esteem issues begin to rise. Emotions run rampant. Pain and brokenness show up in every form. And, and in fact, the further that sex moves outside of God's covenant design, it's almost like the more society collapses. So why is marriage important to sex? Because it is the God-designed pattern for the world to make beautiful music together. It's God's design for the world to make beautiful music. You know, I love what Robert Jordan says about beautiful music. This is what he says beautiful music is. It's the experience of unsolid order. Now, now, now catch this. this is a, it's the experience of unsolid order. Order that hasn't been messed up. Order that hasn't been contaminated, of unsolid order persisting simultaneously at every perceptual level. Wow. Man, that's huge. That's big. And when I think about my life and I think about my activity, I, I look and I say, wow, I, I don't know. I, you know, my life, and it doesn't line up with that, right? The experience of unsolid order. Persisting simultaneously at every perceptual level. I mean, what a tall order. How big is that? I mean, I mean, you think about it when pitch and rhythm and tempo and, 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 and timbre needs to sync together at the same time. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing. Because when any one part is off, it, it isn't quite as beautiful as, as God had designed it. But that's one of the reasons why God places sex inside the covenant of marriage. So that we don't give up. So that, we, so that we keep working at it. So we spend a lifetime making it beautiful with the one that we love. And then the results of that that flows out in our relationship well beyond the act. The emotional connection, the spiritual bonding. It takes place in such power and might that even when the physical isn't possible anymore... You still have that incredible emotional and spiritual bonding between you. I mean, it's just a wonderful thing. 
I, 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 Victor Hugo says, uh, says, and I love this, what he says about music, but he says, music expresses that which cannot be put into words, but yet also cannot remain silent. And here's what I encourage you to do. I, I encourage you to do this. Man, I encourage you to work at making beautiful music God's way. I mean it. Because, man, when you try to take your life and say, man, I want unsullied order, man, at, at every level, and I'm going to work at that, and we're going to work at that together. And, man, the crescendo and highest point of that is when we, when we join together, and it impacts us in ways that will last and last and last and last. Man, I want to encourage you to do that. In fact, if you need a homework assignment, see me after this service. I will give you some homework assignments for this week. But sex, the crescendo, the building to and the highest expression of a husband and a wife that have aligned their heart and their souls with each other and with God. Jesus, we praise you, Lord, and we thank you so very much. Man, I understand that, uh, <laughs> that the world is the dominant voice when it comes to, to sex. I understand that, uh, that they say some things that, that cheapen it. They say some things that make it only physical. They, they say some things that move it outside of your covenant design. But Lord, you are the designer and you are the creator. And so Lord, I, I pray for those of us who are gathered in here. That in our lives we would embrace what it is that your word teaches us and what your word tells us. Then we'll embrace it, and Lord, because of that, man, we will experience uh, our spouse, and we will experience you in ways that we never would otherwise. So Jesus, work in us, work through us, and help us. And Lord, for those who, like me, all of us here probably, who look back on our life and say, you know, my life's been sullied by this thing. Because the drive was powerful and I caved in to instruction or thoughts of the world. Lord, I praise you that your grace cleanses. I praise you that your grace uh, takes us from being solid to unsolid. And there's not one of us here that doesn't have great hope to make beautiful music in your design. So Lord, we embrace your grace and your forgiveness and your power in our lives. Let us think about these things and understand them in your way. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. Now, Lord, in response to your goodness, in response to your grace, in response to your presence and power in our lives, receive what it is we bring and know that it comes from people that love you. You're the great provider. And Lord, receive this as a testimony that we know it and that we want to partner with what you're doing in this world. In your name, Jesus, amen and amen.